This is the second presentation in the series looking at the possible contribution that system dynamics can offer to assist with the UK Department for International Development's Aid for Trade program. In the first part of the presentation, we looked at the project background and purpose and set out the architecture of the trade system so we could see those factors that enable and disable trade. And in this presentation, we're going to look at how we can use that picture of the trade system to organize the portfolio of trade improvement efforts that are being made by many agencies and uh, go on to develop a framework for planning, managing, monitoring and evaluating a whole program of initiatives. The challenge that we're starting with here is that there really are a, a large number of projects being pursued by many agencies. And uh, I should say that the context that we're working on this is the export trade challenge in Nigeria. Uh, so in, in this particular case, we've got initiatives being taken by the government, such as implementing a, uh, a single system, encouraging ports to operate on a 24-7 basis, significantly reducing the number of agencies operating at ports and at borders, We've got the USAID group uh, helping with the modernization of customs. We've got efforts to implement common external tariffs in the region. The European Union is working on specific border post improvements. BIFID itself is involved in uh, another border post uh, trial. Uh, the German aid agency is uh, focusing on improving customs officials training and there are various other regional facilitation uh, initiatives going on. So as I say, there's a lot happening and a lot of different agencies pursuing uh, projects all over the uh, trade environment generally. So how do we understand the interactions and the consequences of all these different initiatives? And how do we try to coordinate these for the best overall impact? Well, we looked in the first uh, presentation of this series at ways of understanding the trade system and recognizing that trade takes place across individual borders. So the trade that takes place in total arises from the sum of all the trade that occurs through each mode. So it's the sum of overland trade, seaborne trade, and airborne trade, and of course, trade in uh, services as well. And each of those is the sum of everything that happens through each specific crossing. So each land border, each port, each airport has trade going uh, through it. And in, in all three cases, there are larger borders and ports and there are smaller borders and ports. There's a very large number, for example, of small land border crossings, uh, both formal and informal in the country. And we have major ports and we have minor ports along the along the coast. So if we're going to improve trade as a whole, the initiatives that all those agencies pursue and the projects that they pursue have ultimately got to work at every one of those specific locations. Now a further difficulty is that those initiatives come at very different levels. So these are the outputs that we want. We want better resources at each port and crossing because we believe that with better resources at each port and crossing, we will get better outcomes, more trade at all of those borders and crossings of all types. We've got site-specific uh, projects such as the initiatives to develop border posts at Okareti and Semi. We've got issue-focused efforts, such as the National Customs Service Training Initiative, the Business Service Provision, the implementation of Single Window. And those outputs are to improve resources generally, not specifically at any particular port or crossing. Then you've got very high-level policy and institution building efforts, such as initiatives to create what's known as authorised economic operators. Uh, that's companies who are able to speed through an otherwise slow trade system, efforts to professionalise the uh, policy in, in customs generally. So as I say, we've got a hierarchy of initiatives amongst that long list of things being pursued by different agencies. We need to be able to get 
from general initiatives to local outcomes. I'll just uh, offer uh, some examples of this. So one of the enablers we looked at in the first presentation was the provision of more officials and better trained officials. So how does training of customs officials actually work? Well, ultimately, it's only going to affect trade if traders at a particular border crossing are better able to get across that particular border crossing because there are more trained officials at that location. So training for the customs service would give rise to more customs officers trained in general, and we would hope that they would be deployed at all of the borders and ports where their additional capacity is most needed, and that will um, enhance trade at each of those borders and ports. Efforts to professionalise the customs service would support that rather more focused intent of simply training customs officers and, and giving rise to, to more customs officers. So we have a, a more professional approach to the management of the customs service generally. If we look at another enabler, the provision of roads, well, you get more trade at a particular border crossing because more roads come into existence reaching that particular border crossing. So an initiative to build more roads gives you more and better roads, and that helps that particular border crossing, but only that crossing to which those roads actually go. And uh, bigger initiatives here are uh, larger projects to improve land corridors generally, which can affect several border crossings, both in and out of the, uh, of the country. If we look at one of the negative issues, one of those disablers that make life difficult for traders, then we get more trade at each specific border crossing if that list of banned products is reduced as it relates to that particular crossing. There are efforts to reduce the whole range of banned products uh, in total that works if it affects the product relevant at a particular border location. And at the high level, we've got broad efforts to improve tariff policy generally, which will have implications for that range of banned products. And we can work through a similar hierarchy of influence for every enabler and disabler to trade that we looked at in the first presentation. So let's get a little bit more specific and take some examples and see how we might map these various initiatives and projects onto this structure. If we list across the top of this uh, table all of the land borders, all of the ports, all of the airports, then an enabler which is focused on adding crossings and building new ports would have a very specific and focused large impact at very particular points. If we were, for example, to train staff, then the availability of more trained customs officials, we would anticipate, would improve our ability to allow trade through all crossings, all ports and all airports. If we were to uh, put efforts into reducing the number of agencies, then the reduced number of agencies involved in in policing trading activity would have differential impacts in different locations. So it might have a significant impact at uh, one or two of the land border crossings. It might have quite a large impact at two of the uh, ports in the country and a large impact at the airports. So what we find when we map the initiatives onto this structure is that we have some initiatives with a very broad impact, training and reduction in the number of documents, for example, we have some initiatives with very particular local impacts, so the adding of a particular crossing or a port or the building of roads in a particular region, the cutting of checkpoints in some part of the country, or the reduction of the number of agencies at, at airports. And we have some projects that are location specific and attempt to address as many of these enablers and disablers as possible in that specific location example there being the Okareti border crossing project. So what we can do is look at the entire list of projects and organize them according to whether they are enablers or disablers and whether they address issues of access, capacity or profitability. 
uh, this exhibit simply offers a start on that process. There is a whole range of additional items to consider, efforts to improve rail infrastructure, uh, improve the reliability of power supplies, develop regional integration in the trade systems, create free trade zones. Uh, there's a whole issue about the cost and subsidy of uh, fuel that's used for transportation and so on. So there's a lot of other items that we've not covered in that allocation of improvements on the left-hand side of that table. So where we've got to is the basis for understanding some of the implications arising from the trade system structure we looked at in uh, part one of the uh, presentation and how that portfolio of initiatives maps onto that. And what that ought to allow us to do is clarify the hope for causal pathways in the system. So what inputs are we making? What outputs are we trying to create? And what outcomes do we expect to arise from those inputs and outputs. That is only possible though if you have a view of the trade system as a whole. But if you have that then you've got the basis for a shared understanding of the entire portfolio of trade improvement efforts. From that we should be able to figure out what to do, when, how much, at what cost and effort and anticipate the benefits that are likely to arise. So for example we ought to be able to anticipate when one particular initiative that looks like it would be a good idea runs the risk of being pointless because some other part of the system is actually uh, going to stop the improvements that it's intended to, uh, to make. This though is only going to be possible if we have a program management system which recognizes the interdependencies between these initiatives and their impact on the system as a whole. But once you've got that it would enable adaptive management of the portfolio. We wouldn't just be looking at this as a snapshot saying, given the state of the trade system right now, the right things to do are A, C and F. We would be able to say the right things to do last year were A, C and F and what we should now be doing is B, D and G. So let's just illustrate how this might work with an example model that deals with just a, a subset of the enablers and disablers. So the items I'm covering in this uh, simple example are on the enabling side, the access uh, improvements as a result from building more roads and adding border posts, and the capacity improvement by providing more skilled staff. And on the disabling side, reduction in the number of banned products, reduction in the number of documents, and the reduction in corruption. So our example program consists of building border crossing posts, increasing the road network to those border posts, reducing the number of banned products, increasing the number of trade officials, reducing the number of documents required to trade in the products that you are allowed to trade, and reducing corruption. Now we can do this work at three levels. The first level is uh, similar to the way I sketched this out in part one of the presentation, where all we do is lay out a diagrammatic picture of the system and sketch estimated scale and time path of the inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And what we'd be doing with this manual approach would be implicitly estimating the interdependencies in the system. But even that would allow us to track actual results against the plan we had by manually putting in what we think has happened each period. And that would allow us to adapt projects and the portfolio as a whole and reallocate spend and effort in light of the progress that we're making. There are two further stages we could go to. We can put that same information into a software model but still do it uh, manually or we could actually create a working software model to do the work uh, for us. I'll say a little bit more about options two and three a little later. So here is an example of how we might manually do this. Uh, we would sketch that chart of what we think is the number of active traders using all small land border crossings in the country and from that estimate the rate at which that may have been changing over recent years. We would add to that history what we hope we might be able to achieve if our efforts are successful 
in uh, increasing the rate at which new traders start trading and therefore the stock of active traders increases but still be conscious that there is a uh, less attractive future in which neither of those two things happen. So on the left we've got the simple number of border posts that are in place and we could count that number and we could see how that number had increased up to today and how we would want it to create increase going out into the future. We could measure the uh, length of roads that reach those border crossings and how that number's changed in the past and how we want that number to grow and we could track what's happened to the number of banned products and set ourselves targets for reducing that number going out into the future. We can then uh, work out from that what we think will happen to the number of people actually trying to cross all our land borders each day and compare that with what we think is the capacity of the borders themselves. What we can then do is think about what's happening to the delays that typically occur at these small land borders. Are those delays uh, gradually being reduced because these and other efforts have been improving things over time? And to what degree, realistically, do we hope to reduce those border delays going out into the future? And those delays arise from an imbalance between the number of people trying to cross those borders and the maximum number of crossings that the borders are capable of processing. And that arises because we have limited numbers of trained officials and there are lots of documents you need to get across the border. So here are two more of our initiatives. If we put in effort to train more border officials, we hope there will be more officials at those border crossings, which will release the capacity of those crossings to let more people through. And if we succeed in reducing the number and complexity of the documents that those traders need to get across and trade, then that too will make it quicker, easier and improve the capacity of the border crossings to, uh, to process traders. Lastly, we've got the profitability uh, issue and the initiative we're pursuing there is to uh, reduce corruption by a better training and better remuneration systems for officials at border crossings. And if we're successful in uh, eliminating corrupt payments that are being made, then that will enhance profitability of trading and that will improve trading frequency. The result of all that is if we have more people trading more often with more stuff, that's what gives us the outcome we want, which is an increase in trading volume and trading value. We can add other enablers and disablers to this structure, and of course we, we can and should replicate it for other broader types. Uh, we're simply looking here at what's going through the total of all small land borders. There are large highway borders, there are large ports, there are small ports, there are airports, but we could have a copy of the same structure that we're using for those other channels. And as I say, the, the first and simplest way to use this is to use it in an entirely manual way. Simply sketch these charts on a whiteboard by hand, estimate the numbers, and uh, estimate the rates at which things have changed and might change uh, going into the future. You can go on to a further stage, which is to put exactly the same information into a software model of the situation, enter those numerical estimates for inputs, outputs and outcomes. You can include some simple calculations to save effort. For example, if you know the number of border officials that you have and you know how many um, traders they can process per hour, then you can figure out how many traders can cross those land borders every day, every month. And then you can enter actual results that you get from sample surveys around those border crossings and from month to month, quarter to quarter, and compare those with the plan that you set out with. And of course, the results will never match what you intended exactly. There will always be differences. You might make less progress than you expected, or if things go well, you might actually make faster progress. And in the light of that comparison between actual results and plan, you can adapt the projects and the whole portfolio and move around to spend effort in light of the progress that you're making. So this is what such a manual model actually looks like. The software allows you to enter the data that populates these charts. And at the top left of this diagram, you've got the stock of small would-be traders, people who would like to trade but haven't got access 
to a border with products that they can sell. The red line here shows the base case where nothing much changes. The blue line shows what might happen if we were to make some of the improvements that we want. The stock in the middle is the number of small traders who have got border access, but for whatever reason are not actually participating in trade at a particular point in time. So you can see that we've done something already to uh, make it possible for would-be traders actually to access the border. The third step though is traders with access who actually are trading. So some of those in the middle stock who have got access to borders have now decided to start trading and are actually going across the borders with their carts or their trucks and selling their goods in the neighboring country. So what we need to know is what are the things that we're doing, how much to move the system in this way. And a further benefit of this is that if all this works, we actually bring into existence new potential traders at the top left of this uh, diagram. The people would start trading if the opportunity was opened up for them. Now the things we're doing to pump people through this system uh, are the things in our list of initiatives. We are increasing access to reach more potential traders through our construction of more border posts, our construction of roads, and our reduction in the number of banned products. We're increasing capacity to allow traders to operate by providing more officials to let them through those borders and reducing the number of documents uh, required to do so. And we're increasing the profitability to make trading worthwhile through our efforts to reduce corruption. And as I say, you can sketch these numbers by hand, but now you can sketch them into the software model and actually enter data in that software model to compare actual outcomes with the likely outcomes you expected in the first place. Now here's how we map the uh, initiative that we're pursuing in the top uh, section of this diagram. We've got the number of small land border posts that actually exist. And if we add the new border posts, we would expect the blue line to grow ahead of what would otherwise have happened, the red line. That comes at cost and effort, which is one of our inputs, and the number in that chart is actually one of our outputs, the number of border posts. If we build more roads, then we know the number of kilometers of roads reaching border posts, and the red base case was showing a slow increase in that uh, network of roads. The blue case shows the result of our efforts to uh, construct or support the construction of more roads. The third section shows the number of banned products, and this is, this is counting the total number of all banned products across the whole economy. Only a fraction of those will be relevant to traders who want to go across uh, small land borders. So that reduction in the number of banned products in general affects uh, particular small land crossings at a particular rate. And it's those interventions in the yellow section on the left that give rise to movements in the number of people on the right. So the first question, are there border posts near small would-be traders? And the blue line there shows how the increase in border posts has improved that number. Then the question is, can those small traders reach the border posts? And that's what the building of more roads on the left does. Then the third question is, are those small traders actually allowed to trade in the products that they would like to? And that's the result of the third initiative on the left. And all of those three things have to happen in order to move would-be traders with no access at the bottom into the stock of small traders who have got border access uh, at the bottom right. Same applies to the next step of the model. The stock at the top is showing the reduction in the number of, of documents required to cross the border. Again, this is all of the documents you might need at any border. A subset of those are relevant to small land borders. Our efforts to grow the number of trained officials. This is the stock of all trained customs officials across the entire trade system. Only a fraction of those are allocated to small land border crossings. And again, there's cost and effort, which is an input to this initiative and the number of trained people is simply the output from that effort. 
Lastly, our effort to cut corruption reduces the proportion of border officials who are engaging in corrupt practices. And all of those three things together answer some other questions. How many hours are lost when we're trying to trade? And the fewer documents required to get across the border reduces the delays and increases the profitability. Reduction in corruption also improves uh, profitability. Then we have the issue of whether there's enough border capacity or not. That's determined by how many uh, documents you require and whether you've got enough officials. All of those things improve on the right-hand side the average number of trips each trader makes each month and the total trips being made. And the number of traders and the number of trips being made are the intermediate outcomes we want. If those things all go well, the volume and value of export trade will rise. Lastly, we can take that same uh, software model where all we've done so far is simply put data into it and actually turn it into a fully functioning uh, software model. Enter numerical estimates for the inputs, outputs and outcomes and compute the expected relationships between them. Then you can compare actual results uh, with plan and adapt the model as well as the policy itself to evaluate changes to projects and to the spend and effort that people deploy. So I've explained the overall structure of this uh, working model. So what I'll do now is just give a, a brief demonstration of how it actually works. When you open the model, you see some uh, information boxes along the top. And on the left-hand side are some control variables which represent the kinds of uh, policies and decisions that you might be making to try to improve this particular part of the trade system. That's people exporting relatively small amounts across uh, small land borders. If we scroll down, you can see the sections that we've described in the presentation, the pieces about the border posts, the development of roads, the number of banned products, and what all that does to the access for small traders using those uh, border crossings. And further down, we've uh, shown the sections relating to the number of documents that those traders need to get across the borders, the number of trained officials available, the extent of corruption, and what all those do to the capacity of borders specifically and to the profitability of trading. We've highlighted some areas in the uh, purple callouts that demonstrate the areas in which the model might need to be uh, extended or uh, adapted to deal with issues that we're simply not capturing in this particular version of the model. So the way to think about this is that the red timelines on all these charts are showing a kind of do nothing uh, situation where there is slow progress in adding more border posts and extending roads, reducing banned products and all those other things. And that has relatively slow uh, impacts on making it possible for people to get to the border posts and actually uh, carry out trading. So um, this will actually run over 60 periods. So we're simulating a kind of five year horizon here. And uh, you simply hit the play button and, and the model will play out the way in which all of these variables change and interact with the policies that you've got set up by default over in the left hand side. Now we can decide to change some of these at any time. So we might, for example, decide to increase the frequency with which we open small border posts. So instead of opening a new border post every 12 months, we'll open one every three months. And if we play for a relatively short period of time, we'll see the number of border posts uh, start to climb really quite quickly. Now, each of those uh, border posts already has some very limited amount of road access. So we might want to increase the rate at which we uh, develop roads from two kilometers a month to 10. And we'll see if we play that forward a little longer, then not only do the border posts start increasing, but the road access grows quite a lot. And that means that more traders can actually reach the border posts as a result of our efforts. Let's make some further changes. So we will speed up the rate at which we're removing banned products from the list of prohibited products for trading. And we can also make some changes, uh, increase the capacity and profitability of the borders. 
So we'll uh, increase the number of border officials because if we're opening border posts more quickly, we'll need more officials to man those border posts. We can speed up how quickly we cut the number of documents required to trade and we can uh, raise the rate at which we reduce uh, corruption. We play that through to the end. We'll see that there's been a small improvement in the uh, profitability of uh, people trying to trade across the border. They were making um, 2,800 Naira per month per trip. Now that's over 3,000 Naira. We made the improvements to profitability rather late in this five year period, but nevertheless, we've got some improvement in profitability. We've got an increase in the number of trips per month traders make at the very end of the period because of that better profitability, which means that the total number of trips being made each month has increased not just because it's more profitable, but also because we've now got more traders actually being active and using those border crossings. So that's just an example of how a model of this kind could be used to uh, play out and test a range of different policies enacted to a different degree at a different rate and explore what impact that all has on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, which is more people trading and trading more often and trading with more stuff. Um, now, anyone can access uh, this model simply by using the share link that we've provided and all they need is a latest version browser. So, for example, Internet Explorer 9 rather than uh, version 8. If you register at sysdea.com for a free account, you can actually save this as a working model and make changes to the model itself. So in the first presentation, we explained the project background relating to Aid for Trade and laid out the principles of the architecture of the system that lies behind how trade actually works so that we could figure out the enablers and disablers to trade. What we've done in this presentation is we've showed how to use those principles to organize the portfolio of trade improvement efforts that are being made by large numbers of different agencies and how that might be used to provide the framework for planning, managing, monitoring and evaluating a whole program of such initiatives. In subsequent presentations, we will explain something about how you can use the approach for detailed planning and control for a specific intervention, where we look at uh, the example of training customs officers and a demonstration of how you might plan and control interventions for a single specific trade border. And both of those come with working models. In the final presentation, we'll look at some of the issues that need to be tackled.